For the next few sections, we are going back in time again to the late 1970s and 1980s. Remember in 1972, Kerr, Wiley and Curry coined the name apoptosis and published their paper on the description of this process at the morphological level. In 1988, Wu, Corey and Adams published their paper demonstrating that BCL2 can block the death of cells after growth factor deprivation. Something that turned out to be extremely important for studies on apoptosis was a publication in 1974 by Sidney Brenner, an investigator at the MRC Laboratory of Molecule Biology in Cambridge, UK. With his publication in the journal Genetics, Sidney Brenner introduced a new model organism to the international research community, the nematode Cinemoditis elegans, all short C. elegans. Why did C. elegans turn out to be so useful for studies on apoptosis? C. elegans turns out to be so useful for studies on apoptosis because the development of C. elegans, including the pattern of apoptotic cell death, is essentially invariant from animal to animal. And this allows the genetic and therefore also molecular dissection of the apoptotic process without any preconceived knowledge. But before we go into these genetic studies, let me give you some more background about C. elegans. Nematodes, or roundworms as they are sometimes called, are a phylum that is part of the ecdysozoa, a group of animals that also include, for example, arthropods. Insects, for instance, such as the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster, another important model organism in the life sciences, are arthropods. Some nematodes can be quite large, and some nematodes are parasites of animals or plants. However, C. elegans is a small, free-living nematode that is completely harmless. It's about one millimeter long and about 50 micrometer wide, and it lives in rich organic matter such as rotting apples in an orchard. C. elegans and related species are found all over the world. The one that Sidney Brenner used for his studies and that the C. elegans community is still using today was apparently isolated on a mushroom farm in Bristol, UK. Why did Sidney Brenner choose C. elegans as a model organism? Sidney Brenner was interested in the nervous system. And he thought that for choosing a good model organism, two criteria were particularly important. First, the organism should have a simple nervous system. A nervous system so simple that its structure could be completely determined. Second, the organism should be amenable to the dissection of nervous system function using genetic studies. Concerning the first criteria, yes, C. elegans has a nervous system that is very simple and that indeed could be completely determined at the structural level. The C. elegans nervous system is composed of exactly 302 neurons. For comparison, the nervous system of the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster has 10 to the 5th neurons, that of mice 10 to the 8th and that of humans 10 to the 11th. Using reconstruction from serial section electron mic micrographs, John White, Sidney Brennan and colleagues determined the structure of the C. elegans nervous system and its pattern of connectivity or connectome in 1986. They found that the 302 neurons are connected to each other or talk to each other through 5,000 synapses, 600 gap junctions and 2,000 neuromuscular junctions. Think about this, a nervous system composed of 302 neurons and 302 neurons exactly. How can that be? This is because of a phenomena referred to as utility or constant cell numbers. Every C. elegans worm has exactly 959 somatic cells and somatic cells are cells that are not germ cells. Every one of these 959 somatic cells has a name and a known function. As you heard already, of these 959 cells, 302, for example, are neurons, and these 302 neurons fall into 118 different classes of neurons. Not only does every C. elegans worm have exactly 959 somatic cells, 
But the development of C. elegans occurs in a highly reproducible manner from animal to animal. This means that we know the ancestry and the descendants of every cell, basically the entire blueprint of a C. elegans worm. And this blueprint is referred to as cell lineage. The entire somatic cell lineage was worked out in the late 1970s and early 1980s by John Salston and co-workers also at the MRC LMB in Cambridge, UK. And this is what you see here. The lineage starts on the top with the fertilized oocyte the zygote, which divides to give rise to two daughter cells, which then divide again, etc. There are 10 to 11 rounds of cell divisions all together. Vertical lines represent individual cells and the horizontal lines represent individual cell divisions or mitosis. The x-axis represents the axis running from the anterior to the posterior of the animal and from, or from head to tail. And the y-axis represents time in hours. What you see in the following movie is the development of a C. elegans hermaphrodite from the first cell division until the embryo is ready to hatch and gives rise to a small worm, the L1 larvae. This movie was taken with differential interference contrast microscopy, also referred to as Normalsky optics, which allows you to see the cells and subcellular structures somewhat in 3D, and that's because it takes advantage of polarized light. Watch out in the beginning when the embryo only has a few cells. The large round discs within cells are the nuclei. Coming back to Sidney Brenner and his search for a model organism suitable for the dissection of nervous system function. With C. elegans, he had found an organism with a simple, essentially invariant body plan and nervous system and a highly reproducible development. Perfect for his purpose. But what about the second criteria? The organism should be amenable to the dissection of nervous system function using genetic studies. I briefly touched on genetic studies during one of the earlier sections. Genetic studies involve the identification of individuals within the population that look or behave differently than the rest of the population, that basically exhibit a mutant phenotype. And the individuals that exhibit this mutant phenotype are referred to as mutants. Mutant phenotypes are often caused by single changes in the DNA of the mutant, and these changes are then referred to as mutations. Once a mutant with an interesting phenotype has been identified, using various genetic methods, one can trace back this phenotype to the gene that is affected by this mutation. Based on its mutant phenotype, the gene can then be assigned a function. Such hunts for mutants of forward genetic screens as they are commonly referred to, are therefore a powerful method to identify genes involved in certain biological processes. They have been and still are a powerful tool for gene discovery. What do you need to do for a genetic screen? You need to go through large populations of individuals, thousands and thousands of individuals. Therefore, you want an organism that doesn't take much space and that is easy and cheap to grow. And for subsequent genetic studies, you need to analyze lots of individuals of different generations. Therefore, you want an organism that also reproduces fast and has lots of progeny. 
Does the elegance fit the bill for this second criteria as well? Absolutely. The elegants are small, but don't they grow on rotting apples and orchards? Fortunately, they can also be cultured on petri plates with agar and a lawn of bacteria, such as E. coli, which they feed on. Very economical. Within a cubic foot of incubator space, you can keep about 300,000 C. elegans worms. Imagine how much space you would need to keep 300,000 mice or 300,000 humans. C. elegans has lots of progeny, about 300 for each worm, and they reproduce fast. They have a generation time of about three days. During those three days, they go through the following stages. Embryogenesis takes about 10 to 12 hours. Part of embryogenesis happens in utero, part of it happens ex utero. After embryogenesis, a small worm hatches, the L1 larvae, and L1 stands for first larval stage. Larval or post embryonic development takes about 48 to 60 hours, during which the larvae grows in size and goes through four larval stages before turning into a fertile adult. If the culturing conditions are not good, for example, if there's no food, too many worms on the petri plate, or the temperature is too high, then L1 larvae can enter an alternative developmental pathway before turning into a L2 larvae. This alternative pathway is referred to as the Dauer stage. Dauer comes from the German and means persistent. As Dauer larvae, C. elegans can survive without food and pretty much dehydrated for weeks and months. Once conditions improve, they can quickly enter the normal development and turn into L4 larvae. These L1 larvae can also be frozen. They can be frozen in a solution with glycerol and kept at minus 80 degrees Celsius, probably indefinitely. Once you thaw them and put them on a culture plate with food, they start moving within minutes. This is actually also a great advantage for genetic studies and genetic screens. It means that you can perform large scale or high throughput genetic, genetic screens and isolate many, many mutants, but that you don't need to analyze all of them right away. Instead, you can focus on the interesting ones and freeze the rest for later. Very convenient. What is also very convenient for genetic studies and genetic screens is the fact that C. elegans has a hermaphrodite sex. C. elegans has two sexes, males and hermaphrodites. C. elegans hermaphrodites can be considered females that, at some point during their development, produce sperm. Specifically, during late larval development, the germline of hermaphrodites, which is composed of two U-shaped gonadal arms, produces sperm, about 300. These sperm are then kept in two pockets called spermatheca here at the end of each of the gonadal arms. The hermaphrodite gonad then switches over to the production of oocytes. The mature oocytes produced are pushed through the spermatheca and fertilized by the hermaphrodite sperm to generate the diploid zygote, the one cell embryo basically. Hermaphrodites are therefore self-fertile, which, as you will see later, turns out to be very convenient for genetic screens. However, for genetic analyses, it is also important to be able to cross different strains, different mutants, and that's why it is good to have males as well. If males mate with hermaphrodites and fertilize them, cross progeny is generated, because male sperm outcompetes hermaphrodite sperm. Finally, C. elegans has a small and very compact genome, which is also advantageous for genetic studies. The human genome contains about 25,000 genes, and the C. elegans genome contains not much less, about 21,000 genes. However, guess what the difference in genome size is? The difference in the number of base pairs is between humans and C. elegans. The 21,000 C. elegans genes are found within a genome that is 100 megabase pairs large, or 100 million base pairs. The 25,000 human genes are found within a genome that is 30 times the size, 3,000 megabase pairs. This comparison demonstrates how compact 
the C. elegans genome is compared to the human genome. Actually, the C. elegans genome was the first genome of a multicellular organism sequenced. It was published in 1998 in the journal Science. It provided technical and conceptual insight that was critical for the completion of the Human Genome Project, for which a draft sequence was published in 2000 and which was essentially completed in 2003. How similar are the genomes of C. elegans and humans? Or let me put the question differently. How many of the 21,000 C. elegans genes have counterparts or orthologs in the human genome? A recent study suggests that about 38% of all C. elegans genes have orthologs in humans. That's more than one third. This finding confirms that many biological processes have been conserved evolutionarily from at least C. elegans to humans. In summary, C. elegans is a simple organism with a simple body plan and nervous system and an essentially invariant somatic cell lineage. It is small, easy and cheap to cultivate. It has a large brood size, a fast life cycle. It can be frozen. It has a self-fertile hermaphrodite and male sex, and it has a compact genome. Sidney Brenner picked well. C. elegans is a great model in which to genetically dissect nervous system function. As we will see in the next section, C. elegans also turned out to be uniquely amenable to the genetic dissection of programmed cell death or apoptosis.